So excited to have you all here today. I've had a chance to meet some of you. My name is Summer Gatherpole. I'm serving as a senior advisor at the Colorado Department of Human Services to help support the Behavioral Health Task Force. We are um, just super excited to kick off the safety net subcommittee. Um, of all the committees in the task force that we have, this is the one I think where we have lots of ability to be creative and really kind of think about what is it that, how do we want to define the safety net? What is it and what, is we, what do we want it to look like? Um, so this uh, subcommittee has a lot of great work ahead of itself. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about that today. Before we dive into our really full agenda, I am excited to introduce to you Michelle Barnes, our executive director at the Colorado Department of Human Services, just to kind of welcome us and get kick things off. Welcome. <laughs> I feel like we've been planning this party for months and <laughs> thank you all for coming. I have to tell you at the uh, Department of Human Services, we could not be more excited about this task force, like over the moon excited. Um, and I think Summer, we have a really interesting chance to do something completely different than how we do things in state government. We have a chance to radically evaluate and vision where we want our safety net to be for the state of Colorado for behavioral health. And I've been traveling the state quite a bit and every county I'm in, every person I meet with wants to talk about mental health and particularly safety net. And I've heard so many stories. Last night I was at one of our um, group homes for people with um, disabilities, development intellectual disabilities, and all they wanted to talk about is how their loved ones have continued to fall through the safety net. Um, just this morning we were talking about another youth that's falling through our safety net. And so we're really looking at you to be bold, to be, um, creative and to really think outside what we've always done. I mean, we need to do that and we need to be willing to respectfully disagree and compromise and come together and then respectfully disagree and compromise again. <laughs> and I was just telling the folks from the mental health centers that my hope is that come April, that we are all proud of the work we do even if we may have, you know, had to move our cheese a little bit to get there. I want everyone to be really proud of this really unique opportunity to do things. And I'm here to thank in advance, um, Robert and Nancy for co-chairing. We could not have better co-chairs of this task force, complete confidence in the two of them. And I'm gonna be listening today as are a lot of the staff from CHS. And if you need anything, we're here to talk to you, but thank you for volunteering. I don't know if you know how much time you just volunteered for, but it's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> But it's going to be it's going to be worthwhile. This is something you're going to be able to tell your kids and grandkids that you were part of changing the behavioral health system in Colorado. So thank you. Off to you too. Thank you. Before we jump into the agenda, I just want to do a little bit of quick housekeeping. We only have two of the subcommittee members joining us by Zoom. So Kyle and Mike are out there in the ether. Um, if anyone else is, if anyone is we're going to do introductions in a little bit. We'll be looking for you to pop up on our computer and we'll add you and make sure that you're introduced during that, during that time. Um, we're not having any feedback from Zoom at this point, but if you can remain muted until you're ready to contribute, it'll help with any feedback coming into the line. Um, if you're joining by only phone, there may be some members of the public that are joining only by phone to participate in the meeting you have to hit star six on your phone. Just muting or unmuting the button on your phone will not get you into Zoom. It doesn't recognize that. So star six to unmute. And we'll put that in the chat so that when you're ready to say something, you're reminded. Um, we'll also be doing some small group work later. We'll be able to virtually break you out. When we get to that point in the meeting, those of you on Zoom, we'll connect with you from the room and make sure you have um, a quiet space to be able to thoughtfully work together as a breakout group. Um, I think that's kind of it. If you can enter your name and organization, if you haven't already into Zoom, that'll help us know that you're here. Um, and just a little level setting objectives for the day is really just to get to know each other is a huge component of why we're here. There's a big turnout today, which is thrilling. Um, and determine how we would like to work together kind of set up some working agreements as a team, as a group about how this work will be handled over the next several months. 
Um, and then Summer and Robert are going to provide some overview of legislation and, and pertinent reports that kind of led to the work of this subcommittee. And then you'll have an opportunity to work together in small groups to really dive into that um, and really get um, oriented as a, as a group around what we mean by safety net. So that's kind of the plan for the day. Your agenda doesn't exactly match our slides because we were thrilled that Michelle was able to join us this morning. We've moved some things around to make sure that everybody's on time and has an opportunity to, to be up here. So um, I, um, I apologize for that. So with that, I will pass to our co-chairs, Robert and Nancy. Um, Nancy prepared some slides. I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me who wants to go first. If Robert wants to kick off and then Nancy wants to do her slides. Mine's brief, so. Go first. Sure. It sounds like we're, the audio is pretty good. That's your mic right there. So I think we should be good. Um, well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, it is going to be an intense few months, but uh, I'm really hoping that, that we come up with, a, with an outcome that uh, that works for everybody, but particularly works for our. Hey, Robert, can you speak up a little bit? All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping we come to an outcome that, that works uh, well and that we all come to an agreement that, uh, but particularly works well for, for citizens of our state and that uh, we figure out something with all the existing partners um, and potential partners about uh, a safety net system that works well. I just want to read something from CHI uh, put out in 2009 on uh, Colorado. Do this. They can't read it oh, there. Uh, Colorado. Uh, uh, it's their primer on Colorado mental health safety net system. It says it's a mix of systems and providers, including community mental health centers, community centers, hospitals, schools, correctional facilities, and other community-based organizations um, that is progressing towards an in integrated behavioral health model that incorporates mental health, substance use, physical health services into a care, uh, into a coordinated care systems. And I know we've done some of this, but the coordinated part's the part that gets me, right? It, it, some of this stuff is still very siloed among these different partners uh, that we have. Um, and I know on the local level, and I'm looking at Frank because I know the new mental health centers on the local level do a lot of these, these local coordinations, but I don't think it, it's, that's true with the entire system from bottom up that it's totally coordinated. So we have different providers, uh, different funding sources um, that are, uh, we have a potential to sort of interlock in a way that, all, that we know what our citizens are or are not getting. I think that's the biggest challenge for me at the state. And um, the last thing for me, you know, we want, I wanted to make sure that we had a county as a co-chair, because uh, to me, they do represent our local, uh, understanding our local needs. And this is what this is really what this is about. This is not a, a state solution, this is a local solution, uh, where the state needs to come and support that. So with that, I challenge our state partners um, okay. for us to be open um, to change hard work um, and willing to modify the way we approach behavioral health because also at the state level there we have 1.2 billion dollars in state and federal funding that's through at least a, a dozen different departments um, that's not coordinated in a way that makes it easy for providers that makes it easy for citizens and I think too often we get stuck into the conversation at the local level about pay source, payer, restrictions, um, requirements for funding, reporting for funding, uh, that doesn't work and it stalls treatment. And uh, I think at the state level, our, as one state department, I think all state departments can be willing to take a step back, uh, willing to give up things, willing to exchange things. And uh, I know we're very prideful of the things we worked hard on, but sometimes that, uh, it, can't, it can't be us to execute. Thank you, Robert. And the mic is Thank you for uh, including counties. Um, most folks don't know what counties do as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But um, I'm, my part is just to welcome, welcome everybody. Um, and um, I'm, I'm thrilled um, to be here. And um, I'm really excited to uh, meet you and um, get things going. So um, it, it, this, this is going to be a challenge. And I'm going to talk a little bit about myself pretty soon. But, um, I'm a, a recovering professor, so particularly for the slides and the handouts and the, all that. So anyway, um, we have to talk about what we mean by a safety net. I just uh, returned from a couple of conferences, and one of them was with the uh, Community Action Group. And uh, they're part of the safety net, and um, they're folks that receive CSGB, CSGB grants, CSGB. 
BG friends. Thank you, Elson. Elson knows what it is. Um, anyway, um, folks who are doing you know direct service for food banks and seniors and stuff. Yeah. Um, we're gonna see if we can get this because it keeps going in and out. Yeah, I know. Let's see if we can get this. Okay. Sorry, I'm not trying to use that. Okay. Um, so it's. I mean, these are questions for you. Why is it important? How are we doing as a state? Do we have gaps? Are there pain points? And think of all the related issues that we all face. Every time I go to a meeting, housing comes up, transportation comes up, medical care, all these so-called barriers to really living a, a, a healthy and, and thriving life. So as, as Robert said, what is the role of state and local? And then finally, we have to think about when we leave here, when we're all done, we say, wow, that was really a great, a great committee. What do, what do we want to have done? Because I don't know about you, but I'm here to get something done and not just to talk. So. I thought it might be useful for you to know who I am. Most of you have not met me. Uh, I am a county commissioner now, um, and I am representing counties. Not, you can see on the map, that's Arapahoe County. That's um, my county, but there are 63 other ones that, um, that are also, um, I'm trying to be mindful of. Um, I do have a former life as a teacher and a consultant. Um, but more importantly, my community works, I put all those acronyms, the uh, CCJJ, the Colorado Criminal and Juvenile Justice Committee. Um, CCI is our Colorado Counties Inc. And on, in that organization, that's countywide, I chair the Public Safety and Justice Committee. Uh, Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners, I am happy to be chair this year of that um, board. Um, Colorado Workforce Development Council. I sit on that as well as our local Workforce Development Council. And Aurora Mental Health, I also sit on that board, plus a bunch of other things. So not only am I busy with the county work, but most commissioners are very active in, in the community. So what do county commissioners do? Very few people actually know. It's really interesting. Many of you vote for one, but you don't maybe know what the too. So we're responsible for the workforce centers, you know, helping people get jobs at a livable wage. We're responsible for human services, TANF, food stamps, all of that. Our public health system, the county's responsible for that. In Rathville County, Adams and Douglas, we, use, uh, we have Tri-County Health. And we're also responsible for courts of the jails and judicial services, amongst other duties. So it's, it's a big job, and again, most folks don't understand what we do. But I think those are some of the reasons why um, I was asked to, to serve, and I, I hope to do a good job. So I put all this stuff on the slide. One of my pet peeves in life is um, people who put stuff on slides that you can't read. So here it is. That's why I gave you handouts, because I don't expect you to read all this stuff. So I gave you four pages, basically, of some handouts with some statistics because there's some things in here that are pretty startling, at least to my way of thinking. One in five in, um, individuals experience a serious mental illness. One in 25 adults live with a mental illness. That's a huge chunk of us. That is us. So um, there, there are a number of statistics here. Depression and anxiety, 18% of adults live with anxiety disorders. 7% live with major depressions. In Colorado, 11.7% 11 of youth <coughs> experience a major depressive episode, and that is increasing. These, these statistics are increasing in Colorado. Suicide. This is this just it's just amazing. I have conversations with our coroner 
who is just devastated by the number of kids that she sees who have committed suicide, not to mention the opioid overdoses and other kinds of, of um, needless, really, needless deaths due to substance use, mental health, school dropout, juvenile detention, homelessness, all of these things are touched by mental health and substance use disorders. So this is a serious problem. Obviously you can't read that, but in the Colorado Crisis Services, which I believe is a great step forward, and I did give you this handout, and I knew you couldn't read it, but um, <coughs> The numbers are increasing of the people we serve. The number of people who call the hotline, the number of people who walk into the crisis center, it's overwhelmed and overtaxed, but at least it's a start. Our tribe can obviously do that. And I gave you this, um, this, these statistics from our Tri-County Health Department because it shows you how just in one county, for those who are looking into the black and white photos, the, the front and back. Yeah. So, oh, so, sorry. Um, handouts. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and then on the back, the big really dramatic one. It's actually, if you saw it in color, it's really, um, <laughs> looks like this in color, which I think is a little dramatic. But um, just think about how, how we don't necessarily think about justice and mental health, except nowadays, People are beginning to understand that our jails are our, our last resort for mental health treatment, which should not be. The sheriff's department, the deputies don't have the training. So, um, behavioral health issues on the bottom here related to recidivism. So, it's a huge problem for counties, it's a huge problem for our communities. And I believe that this, this group can help. Can, can help um, resolve some of this, I'm hoping. So here's more rhetorical questions for you. What pops out? What do you want to know more about? Think about what questions do you have and what ideas do you have? We really need to begin to think really creatively because we have what we have because we've done what we've done. Makes a lot of sense, right? And maybe we need to do something different. And oh my gosh, the state is giving us the opportunity to do something. So let's do it. So you, each of you, were selected to be on this committee. Your perspective, whatever it is, and I haven't met you yet. Whatever it is, your perspective is really, really important. So I obviously have a county perspective. Robert has it's a state perspective. You have a variety of other perspectives. But there were over 700 people that applied for these committees and you were chosen. So think about that. We want to know, do Coloradans have the access, the programs, the treatment, and the information that they need? And how do you know and how do we measure that? How do we know? What do they need? And how do we know? <laughs> there was mention, this is a real time commitment. I think we had to sign. So. <laughs> the official notarized stamp treatment. <clears throat> but we, we really do have to make a commitment to be here and to be on time and to be really open and creative and, um, and get to work. And I know we can come out of here really having done and accomplished something. So, um, so welcome. <laughs> So, Nancy, if you could turn the power off on that, and then we can turn the power on on this. Great. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Robert and Nancy, for that warm introduction. 
certainly have given us a lot to think about. My name is Jonathan Uther. Uh, many of you know me from my work at Salute Family Health Centers. Uh, I'm also a member of the Farley Health Policy Center team, and we are uh, very, very grateful for the opportunity to provide some facilitation for these meetings. Um, uh, this is a little bit of an overview of our work and what we've done. We've done similar yet different work in various states, including Oregon, Virginia, uh, a little bit in Idaho and Connecticut, among other things. Um, everything ranging from certainly stakeholder convenings such as this, um, discussing payment, discussing workforce, um, and really trying to unify stakeholders um, across systems to try to um, work towards uh, alignment and similar goals. Um, so that's certainly what we're going to hope to do here. Um, thank you, especially Nancy, for your overview and some of the uh, data that you provided. Um, in addition to the very impressive rates of, of prevalence of mental illness and concern, I would also add um, it, as many as half or more of those individuals with an identified mental health concern, um, both locally in Colorado and nationally, still do not receive access to care. So I think. Um, you know, as the safety net committee, I would in encourage us to, to think about um, ways we can streamline access and increase access across all parts of the system, as has already been touched upon. Um, quick, can we just go to the next slide? A um, couple, uh, yeah, well, I guess a couple more housekeeping things before we dive in. We are very, very eager to do introductions. We're going to hear um, a little bit more extensively from all the members of the subcommittee, but we also want to hear um, briefly from the members of the public about who you are and who you represent. A um, couple of quick housekeeping, additional logistics. Um, for the gentlemen in the room, we get a special access pass badge for the restroom, which is through those doors, um, and then immediately to the left through the double doors, you'll need the badge to come back into the building. Um, Young Shen has the badge. And sorry, yes, thank you. Young Shen has the badge <laughs> over um, on this table back here. Um, what else? Room temperature. Oh, we are working on the roof temperature. We are very aware that it is uh, quite warm in here, so they are working on that. Um, and then last thing, we're, we're going to be hopefully talking about a lot of things, and, and I also appreciate Nancy's questions um, from a level setting standpoint. Uh, it, it, the Nancy posed some very thought-provoking thought questions, um, which fall in line with an activity that we're going to uh, do in some breakout sessions and, and uh, smaller group discussions here in a little bit. Um, and we recognize that we won't be able to get to everything today. Um, or, you know, given all that this task force or this subcommittee wants to take on, um, there may be things outside of the scope or um, uh, outside the realm of what this subcommittee is able to do. So we are going to um, table and, and kind of shelf some topics and we will keep a running parking lot um, for items that we um, either aren't able to get to or maybe more appropriate for uh, another subcommittee or, or the task force at large. Um, anything else there? So with that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Robert and Nancy to provide a little bit of an overview. Oh, no, we're doing introductions. Yeah. We are doing introductions. Okay, great. So um, we'll start with members of the subcommittee, and I'll just start here, if that's okay. And uh, I think it'll be helpful if we go ahead and pass the mic um, so that everyone in the room and on Zoom can hear uh, as well as possible. Um, so Mr. Duff, I'll turn it to you. And, oh, sorry. Well, just because I'm the time... I'm intense about time. Um, we are going to try to move around the room quickly so that we can really get into the work of why we're here today. We do want to hear from you and what inspired you to be on this subcommittee, but also in a succinct fashion, if I can request. And then we'll go around to members of the public and we'll just ask for name and organization real quickly so that you can um, share who you are and, and then we'll move on. And we'll also hit Zoom. Yes, and we will hit the people on Zoom. Okay, so I just had to do that. Very good. Thank you, Stephanie. So again, from members of the subcommittee, um, this is your name. Who are you representing? Um, and as Stephanie said, some brief words about what inspired you to participate on the subcommittee. Good morning. My name is Kevin Duffy, and I'm a captain with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, and I'm uh, currently in the commander of our Criminal Investigations Major Crimes Unit. Um, the last five years, I spent as the commander of our detention facility in Douglas County. And uh, that opportunity really uh, opened my eyes about the mental health world and uh, the things that we're dealing with. So my whole goal is uh, to learn from each of you, but also to bring you 
um, any insight or be able to answer any questions you have when dealing with the, um, the detention portion. Um, as Nancy said, sadly, if you talk to any jail commander up in Devil Farm Range, the county jails have become the mental institutions for the entire state of Colorado. At any given time in our facility, we had 45 to 50 percent of our inmates had some type of mental health diagnosis of one. I had five full-time mental health clinicians working in the jail. One of the things that they constantly stressed to me is these are the ones that we know that have been diagnosed prior to coming in. Your numbers are higher, closer to 70 to 75 percent of the inmates in county jails are dealing with a severe mental health issue from the mental health crisis. So um, that's just some of the things that I want to bring to the committee. Um, and uh, I also am the uh, chairman of the board for the Juvenile Assessment Center in the 18th Judicial District. And one of the things we've seen is a huge spike in mental health services and calls with the juveniles within the four counties in the 18th. So I'm just uh, looking forward to working with everyone. Thank you. I'm Christina Daniel. I'm the Vice President for Program Development at Advantage Treatment Center. We're a community corrections organization in Alamosa, Montrose, Sterling, and now Lamar. Um, we have intensive residential treatment facilities, 90-day substance use treatment for offenders in two of those locations currently. I am also a member of the Alamosa City Council and a member of the board for the Caring for Colorado Foundation. And so I um, am very excited about um, being here uh, representing rural areas, I hope, and talking about some of the challenges from rural areas, as well as from a city policy perspective as well, talking about how we can work together um, to, to kind of pull everything together. Um, and prior to my current position, I worked at the San Luis Valley Behavioral Health Group for 10 years. And so I've had a little bit of an experience of different pieces of the system and different funding sources as well. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everybody. My name is Frank Cornelia. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for the Colorado Behavioral Health Care Council. We're a membership organization and advocacy organization that represents all of Colorado's 17 community mental health centers. Uh, those, um, and we rep I'll get to them and back to them in a second, but we also represent the four managed service organizations. They contract with the Office of Behavioral Health to put together a network to ensure a, con a continuum of services uh, throughout the state in uh, sub-state planning areas. So there, uh, as I mentioned, there are four of those multiple uh, planning regions, so a couple of them hold multiple contracts. Community mental health centers have been mentioned in the introductions by Director Barnes and um, uh, Director Worthwine. And so I want to, I know I need to be succinct, but we're going to be talking about them frequently. Uh, we have often, over the course of our history, put ourselves out there as a safety net uh, providers. Uh, we have, uh, our system was created in with the Community Mental Health Act of 63. That uh, act was never fully realized, so um, it uh, eventually got block granted. Um, and uh, the 17 community mental health centers each uh, serve a catchment area that is a reflection of the grants, uh, uh, an old uh, formula, um, but reflects the grants and they continue. Uh, There's one thing that I think Colorado uh, prided itself on is a continuation of those service regions. Um, we, uh, you know, so that's uh, as far as uh, who I'm representing, representing community mental health centers and managed service organizations. We represent two specialty clinics. I guess the other thing that inspired us to participate, um, certainly we want to be a part of the solution, uh, both community mental health centers and managed service organizations. The other thing that inspired us um, is this conversation about the system being broken. There, things are not working and we have a public health crisis. Um, but there are some things that are working well, and we need to do a better job probably of coordinating those things, scaling those things up. And we wanna be able to bring you some of those stories about what's working in local communities. The other thing I guess I would mention too, just on the community mental health centers, again, they're pointed out in introductions, and we talked about moving the cheese. We are open to change. We have been asking for change. We have been uh, very vocal in identifying gaps in services. And I guess the one thing I would add is that, you know, the, the biggest change for behavioral health came with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. No other sector of healthcare changed as much 
uh, as behavioral health did with the passage of that act. We have not done very much to sort of reorganize how we administer, regulate, fund, finance behavioral health in Colorado. And I think it's time that we, you know, maybe take a look at um, the fact that the community delivery system reflects how we are organized. And so Robert, I appreciated your comments in your introduction that we're not just talking about potentially moving the cheese or changing things up in the community delivery system, but we have to look at how we've organized our financing, our regulations, and our administration of behavioral health and state government. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this and look forward to the work. Hi, I'm Kim Gonzalez. I'm with the Los Angeles Orfano County's District Health Department. I'm the Public Health Director. We're a very rural um, frontier county. We serve a bi-county, which is Trinidad and Los Angeles and the surrounding areas. Um, what inspired me to be part of this group is we have a um, severe crisis in our two counties where we don't have behavioral health that's available for all. There's an inequity there. Um, we have availability for Medicaid patients, but there's a three month wait list. Um, we're seeing a lot of self-medicating down in our areas, which is causing um, a very high overdose rate. Um, was just with opioids, but now it's all over the spectrum with substance use and alcohol. And so going forward, I'd like to see how we can integrate public health in early intervention and prevention with behavioral health in our bi-county health department and be able to offer equity for all with mental health in our communities. Hi, uh, my name is Amber Case. I am representing Centra Health and their Director of Integrated Behavioral Health. Um, what inspired me to be part of the Behavioral Health Task Force or the subcommittee? Um, I spent the first five years of my career working with chronically homeless individuals. In the next three, working in community mental health before I went to Centra. And I've witnessed how broken our system is and I've witnessed things that work well. Um, I'm really passionate about making sure that our jails are not our primary provider and neither are the streets. Um, so that's what brought me here. My name is Deb Ruttenberg. I am the Director of Human Services for Grand and Jackson Counties. If you don't know where Grand or Jackson County is, Jackson County is in, uh, just on the other side of the divide um, across the mountains from Learwood County. It's about a county of 1,500 people. Grand County is a little bigger and you might recognize that from Winter Park for the, the west entrance to Rocky Mountain National Park. So. Uh, we see a lot of different areas in, in need for mental health services. We see our residents that are facing long drives, issues around um, transportation and not having public transportation, things like that. And then we see a lot of tourists come in. And if you talk to our sheriff's department, a lot of their calls are from tourists and they end up being around mental health issues. And so we have this influx. We can go from about 15,000 people which are approximately our year-round residents, up to 60, 70,000 people in a weekend. And so we have issues around that. The other um, area that I, I feel like I was inspired to participate because is because I am married to an elementary school counselor and I see and hear the stories that he comes home with, as well as being the mom of 16-year-old twins one of whom um, suffers from anxiety. So personal and professional levels combined. And uh, the rural area, I feel that um, oftentimes rural and uh, the Northwest region is my posse. Um, and, I, and I wanted to make sure that they had a voice. Hey, I am um, go by my middle name, Clint. So Clint Gray, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm the medical director of Cedar Springs Hospital down in Colorado Springs. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, so after med school, did a psychiatry residence. I also did a fellowship in child, child and adolescent psychiatry, and also did a fellowship in forensic psychiatry, so I like the law stuff too. And I got involved because I feel like I'm surrounded by a bunch of really smart people, but we're like an Instagram feed with no followers, um, so there's great ideas and no one hears. So I said, doggone it, let's go tell some people stuff. So here we go. Hi, I'm Jessica Sharp. I'm from Kit Carson County Public Health and Environment, which if you don't know where Kit Carson County is, about 12 miles from Kansas. You probably stopped there to get gas at some point. Um, 
I am the Communities That Care Coordinator as well as the Mental Health Consultant for Public Health and Nurse Family Partnership in general. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and was hired for the goal of trying to figure out how to integrate behavioral health into public health. But prior to that, I worked for seven years for the local community mental health center doing both outpatient and crisis services. Um, and I'm really excited to be here because I've been a part of the system, I've seen the gaps, I've spent countless nights working through people with those gaps, so really hoping to bring a, a rural and um, hands-on-ground perspective. Thank you, good morning. Uh, my name is Tracy Bradford Walker. I am a probation officer with the city of Aurora. I've been a probation officer for about eight, 17 years now. Um, what I do, my caseload is mental health and at the city we have a wellness program. And so a lot of those people there are severely mentally ill, they have drug abuse problems, whatever. So my life work has kind of been with the mentally ill, but then on a personal level, um, about nine years ago, my sister had a mental health crisis and even working in the system, we didn't know how to get her help. Um, and it was so frustrating. And so it was personal for me and I've made it my kind of life work to not let anyone ever have to go through that again. It was frustrating, the police wouldn't help, the judges, the courts, we tried everything to get her help and we didn't know how to do that. And so when you have a family member, someone that you care about and you're seeing them suffer and you just don't know what to do, what do people do? So I sit on that other side. So when these people come to me, I want to help them. They need to be helped because it's, it's, it's horrible uh, to see someone go through that level of mental illness. Uh, she's fine now. Thank God. She's fine. She's doing well. We've got her medicated and all that. But it wasn't an easy process. So I'm here to, um, from my professional side, to help the people that I work with every day, but also personal side too. My name is Allison George. I'm the director for um, housing at the state um, in the Department of Local Affairs. Um, for the last three years, I've served on the uh, legislative advisory committee for people with mental health disorders involved in the criminal justice system, otherwise known as MHDCJS. Um, so I have been uh, working and talking about a lot of the issues uh, I think that we'll be addressing um, in this committee or subcommittee, so I'm excited about that. Uh, for housing, uh, we actually work with uh, local partners. Uh, our work is dependent on local partners, so um, the Aurora Mental Health or San Luis Valley, um, these are all uh, communities that we work in through partnerships. Um, that said, we also uh, are the administrative agency for the Fort Lyon Supportive Residential Facility, uh, where we're working with dual diagnosed people coming um, from homelessness. Um, and so that's actually a three-year transitional program. So um, I do have uh, some knowledge about uh, working with folks with substance use disorders. Um, that said, uh, three months is very challenging to have success. <laughs> And so I do look forward to um, uh, those discussions as well. Um, I recently joined, and I see one of my fellow members, I believe, uh, for the Community Corrections Advisory Committee. Um, so there are lots of intersections um, in the housing world uh, because it is a safety net uh, resource. Uh, and without housing, um, it's very challenging for people to be successful. Hello, my name is Evan Silverman, and um, I'm representing myself today, and I was on the um, Board of Directors of Mental Health Colorado from 2009 to 2017, and I'm not now on the Board of Advisors and on something called which is a network of advocates, and a couple of folks, including Lauren Snyder over there, um, said, Evan, you know, you may want to take a look at this task force, and so I looked at it, and I and I a couple of main things that I really like is the regularity of the meetings. I feel like we have enough time where we can really make a difference, and I also like that um, the size of the group. And I'm really looking forward to um, listening to everyone here, and hopefully coming up with some ideas that will help the people of Colorado. Um, I started working at the Tattered Cover Bookstore in 1997, and um, I have been away from the store since last November, but I'm hoping to return hopefully soon. Um, and um, I've done a little bit of writing um, and some volunteer work as well. 
Um, I am also, I have a mental health diagnosis as well. And so I hope that connected to that, that that will help give me a perspective that will make this subcommittee better. Thank you. Uh, I'm Robert Worth, I'm the director for the Office of Behavioral Health, um, but also the former director of the Children and Youth and Families, which was responsible for child welfare and youth corrections. So when we talk about adults, we also have the same issue with children. Uh, particularly the, um, the, the, the one thing I hope this group takes on is the constant um, struggle of payer source based on who's intellectually developed with disability and who has a, a psychiatric diagnosis. Um, based on diagnosis and people um, it's those, that, that group particularly it seems to fall through the cracks over and over and over and over again um, so I'd love for us to tackle that I also uh, I got asked like which committee subcommittee do I feel do I really want, I want to be on and this was it I mean this is the, the biggest opportunity for this group uh, the other two groups sort of had plans um, that were already established I think we're, we're starting to blank slate uh, I'm I hope you all are too, but I'm open to everything. I really am open to everything. I would like it to be, uh, I'd like not to be ranked so poorly in behavioral health as a state. And it's, well, not only because, you know, it doesn't reflect well on my resume, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but also because we just got ranked number one for economic, uh, ec the state as an economic uh, health. Uh, and we, we're ranked number one, number two, when it comes to physical health in the country. Uh, I can't understand why we're ranked so low when it comes to behavioral health. So I'm really open to, to what that means. And that means everything. It means, uh, it, and I've said this before, so I'm not shy. Uh, um, my office has the, the mental health institutes and it also has community behavioral health. Uh, I'd be willing to give up any and part of that if it means that, that we get it right and it works. So uh, I'm really putting it, when I say putting it on the table for my state department fellows and myself, is true as well. Uh, it can't be a consumer's problem that we've not figured it out as far as uh, uh, from a systemic standpoint. I am Nancy and <clears throat> I introduced myself but um, a thought just came. Um, you know we're also low on, we rank very very low on education and as a former educator I wonder um, if there's a connection. I don't know. Um, anyway I'm glad to be here and um, I think I've said enough about myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, my name is Melissa Edelman. I work for the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, uh, informally known as HICPUF. Uh, HICPUF is responsible for Health First Colorado, which administers Colorado's Medicaid program uh, for approximately 1.3 Coloradans. Uh, in addition to that, we also administer the Child Health Plan Plus program, which has a behavioral health component uh, tied to it as well. Um, we like other areas of the state in both uh, in, even uh, with indigent care or uh, with commercial insurance, we struggle with network adequacy issues, um, having enough of the right types of providers to serve our members. Um, so I'm really interested in um, how we can work to kind of fill some of those gaps and really provide a full continuum of care for Coloradans um, that's almost like seamless. So sometimes we're, we're really taping things together to get members through the system the way that we need to. So not just to, to get enough of the right type of providers, but to really work on that flow for members as they're moving through the system um, so they're not headed to uh, corrections or through our jail. Um, that we have the proper trims um, uh, to, to get the mental health treatment that they need. Uh, so that's why I'm here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joy Hart, and I'm here representing Colorado Department of Corrections. I'm the Chief of Behavioral Health Services. So prior to my career in Department of Corrections, I was immersed in community mental health centers, working with adjudicated youth through treatment and their families and the school to prison pipeline is real. And I've seen clients that I work with as youth in prison and serious crimes, not for short term, lifetime without parole, and that's heartbreaking. We have, um, and I am committed to developing and providing quality behavioral health care for the offender clients in prison, but I am absolutely opposed to having to provide that mental health care in prisons. It's just not the location. Um, additionally, I'm inspired and very, very pleased to be on this subcommittee because I am also an aspiring uh, 
private practitioner trying to serve my community in El Paso County and Colorado Springs. I consider myself very, very committed to marginalized and high-risk populations. I can't navigate the barriers. And I got some wherewithal and skill, and I'm not getting success. So I'm hoping to contribute on that end. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Tom Manzion, and uh, I've had parallel careers for many years. So I'm here representing behavior healthcare uh, professional service providers and also the uh, law enforcement uh, community. I'm currently um, a licensed professional counselor at the doctorate level, serving as a clinical director with an organization called Attention Homes in Boulder. And I continue to be involved uh, in law enforcement, active law enforcement. Um, attached to the Adams County Sheriff's Office and uh, the, the Town of Ward. I'm here because about a minute ago I was witness to um, what happened to those that were dealing with major mental illnesses when the, the hospitals disappeared, um, all types of residential programs disappeared back in about the 60s and the 70s, all those folks landed on the street. And I believe we're still suffering the consequences of those lack of services present day. So I'm here motivated uh, with the idea in mind that I think collectively we can do something to change that. And I'm excited to get the opportunity to do it. Thanks for uh, giving me that chance to be here. My name is Sarah Bain, and I also represent counties like Nancy. So I'm assistant county manager for Summit County Government. And I oversee the um, human services, public health, public safety departments in our, in our area. Um, we also just passed a ballot initiative in November um, and $2 million a year will go to support local efforts in mental health. And part of the reason that we put that on the ballot and that it passed so overwhelmingly was because we felt frustrated with the lack of services and, and as hard as we tried to understand how the funding streams worked and, you know, potentially what we were hoping we would get or should be getting in our community, we just felt like we needed more flexible funding for our, for our local community. So we're just starting to kick off some of those um, programs, which is very exciting. And uh, I'm also here because I, I also have a daughter who's um, got a severe mental illness. She was diagnosed when she was very small. And so I know how exhausting it is to be a parent when your kid goes in and out of crisis. And just like Tracy said, you know, started in private practice and worked in the crisis system for 20 years and feel very well resourced and yet finding what my daughter needs and ongoing now she's about to turn 18 and that's actually not any more comfort than <laughs> when she's a child because she's moving into some more autonomy so I'm here on behalf of uh, families and parents and children and also um, primarily my community Good morning, I'm Aisha Russo. I'm currently the director of the Office of Disability Rights for the City and County of Denver, and I oversee the Mayor's Commission for People with Disabilities. Um, what inspired me to participate in the, in the subcommittee is I, uh, prior to becoming a tenure track professor, I was a clinician for many years, um, and another state was a um, clinician inside of a women's prison. Um, and to say that the majority of the women that were there um, needed great assistance around mental health disorders is an understatement. Um, and then also as a clinician work with individuals with co-occurring disabilities, um, primarily substance abuse and um, mental health and as well as physical disability. So um, certainly hoping to be able to provide some insight and um, bring it back to our own city where we are here in order to um, move the needle on some things. Hi. Uh, I'm Rick Sims, and um, my background is I'm a CPA, and I have my own firm, which as of late, I'm doing more work with social impact companies. A lot of them are involved in some behavioral health uh, solutions, and I'm very excited about what the opportunity is for that. And like everyone, I've had family members that have uh, behavioral health issues. So about 13 years ago, uh, one of the board members on the Mental Health Center in Denver, uh, Nancy Gary, asked me to go on the board. And if anybody knows Nancy Gary, when she says to do something, you generally do it. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, it's been a great experience for me. I've been uh, chairman of the board. I've been on all of the subcommittees of the board, including the finance committee. So I'm really familiar uh, with some of the pay issues and that that we have in the state. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do to just improve this whole situation for the state of Colorado. Hi, I'm Marilyn Fawcett. I live in Boulder. I, I am retired from two different careers, being a special ed teacher, English teacher, and also a technical writer. And I am here as a parent advocate. However, I want to expand that. I've been kind of the safety net for my son, who's 29, has fetal alcohol syndrome, which the main symptoms are behavioral issues. He was going to end up, uh, it was obvious, in jail after two arrests. And my goal was to keep him from being served by the jails. So he is now being served um, with the Developmental Disability Services. His tone is in a good place. So, and, and I feel like one of the issues, I'm also an adoptive parent, very um, involved with the adoptive parent community. And I get calls, I think there's a lot, there's, what's missing a lot of times is a diagnosis, whether it's the fetal alcohol exposure, whether it's mental health, and, and often they go together. Uh, so I'm gonna, that's one of my things that I'd like to see improved on. I've been involved with Illuminate, an organization that deals with um, substance abuse, a substance exposed newborns, but it also covers really all ages. And I'm on the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Identification Committee. I've also been in, um, involved with the uh, HICPUF before with, as being a parent advocate for people receiving disability services. And I'm, also, I'm often the only person that's a parent representing the client with everybody else from agencies. So I really hope I can bring in sort of um, a message from the trenches. And, uh, and I feel like I've been my, own, my, my son's safety net and I'd like to expand that. So I'm really glad to be here. Great. Um, I'm Carla Faro. I'm a public health uh, suicide prevention researcher and a uh, mental health provider. Um, my, I'm here to represent veterans and the people who serve veterans. Uh, I served in the Army and I've been uh, doing mental health work with veterans and service members for about a dozen years. Um, I currently work at the VA, but I don't represent it. Uh, I just wanna make that clear. Um, but I also, I, yeah, I get in trouble with my boss if I said otherwise. But um, I realize like the, the VA does not meet all of the needs of veterans, especially we're looking at the most mar marginalized veterans who are um, using community resources or just as much as the rest of the population. But um, I guess I'm here to represent veterans. I'm here to talk about prevention, to focus on prevention. Um, while we have you know gaps in services and uh, not enough resources for everybody, we also have unlimited needs. So if we can reduce some of the burden by, uh, by preventing people from getting seriously mentally, you know, reaching that crisis point or needing you know, those high level of services, that'd be fantastic and allow more of, the, um, more of the safety net resources to help other people. Um, so that's why I'm here. Good morning, my name is Eva Veach. I'm representing Region 10, the Area Agency on Aging. We're also the COG for a six county region in Western Colorado. Um, I, I'm the Area Agency on Aging Director and the Aging and Disability Resources. Um, coordinator for Western Colorado. I'm also a long-term care ombudsman, so we, we see a lot of gaps in the ombudsman program for our elders in nursing homes and assisted livings who need mental health treatment. The reason, one of the reasons I'm here is I lost my husband to suicide 16 months ago, and I have two adult daughters dealing with major depressive disorder, and they are also at high risk for suicide. So it's personal, it's professional, and I'm hoping that, that with all of you, we can make a difference. My name is Lauren Snyder. I'm the State Policy Director with Mental Health Colorado. We are the state's leading advocacy organization for people with mental health or substance use issues. 
Um, Manal Colorado champion set at level 222 that brought you all here, so I'm sorry, but I'm really excited for you all to be here. Um, the majority of the language that you see in there um, comes from what we hear from consumers. I, my family member was denied care because they were aggressive. My family member lived at a hospital because nobody would accept their certification in the community. My family member had a co-occurring mental health or substance use issue and they were had trouble finding care that could um, deal with a whole person. And so that's, I think, what I'm most excited for is to move the system to be um, focused on the experience of the consumer um, more than anything. So, um, thank you. We're now going to move to um, Zoom introductions, and I'll call your name and just make sure you unmute yourself. If you're on the phone line, um, star six to unmute. Um, Mike. Hey, good morning, everybody. Mike Nugent. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at CDPHG. We've had kind of seen the impact of behavioral health um, in medically underserved communities for multiple different roles. I started my career as a paramedic in East Oakland, California. Spent over a decade at Denver General Paramedics, including uh, Chief of Denver Emergency Medical Services. Spent a few years uh, as Vice President of Operations for a large federally qualified health center, um, integrated primary care, and some of the more impoverished zip codes uh, in the state. But, um, so, you know, and included in that role was running the revenue cycle. So in addition to the provider experience and taking care of these patients, seeing the inadequacies of acute kind of crisis care uh, for behavioral health affected patients, um, you know, the, running the realm, have a viable safety net healthcare organization with all of the payment. Um, gaps and and weaknesses um, gave me kind of a different look at it. But the probably the, the you know the most compelling experience I had was deputy county manager in Eagle County, where I guess, you know it's a small community, and and on um, the issue of behavioral health access and and, and more specifically suicide in that community, um, really tore a hole in it and sitting with those families and community members talking about you know system inadequacies and challenges um you know reminded me that there's so much work to be done in this area and i think eagle county's experience and how they responded to it um and the and and the changes that they've made or in the process of making to that health system gives me a sense of optimism that creative solutions can be employed um, even with today's resources to do a better job. Uh, you know, my role at CDPHG, uh, we were handed the governor's goal of suicide reduction statewide. Um, and so, you know, obviously, safety net, the safety net population and behavioral health, um, you know, high functioning behavioral health system is, is critical to us successfully leading that goal. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to being part of the committee and, and learning as much as I can about um, the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. Kyle Phillips. Uh, thank you. My name is Kyle Phillips. I live in Alamosa, Colorado. Um, hi, Chris. Um, I, um, uh, I'm representing Valley wide. I'm really representing myself <clears throat> professionally. Um, I'll be uh, transitioning from Valley wide uh, around the 1st of September. So um, I still have a passion uh, professionally and personally for behavioral health. Uh, it's been a part of my career. Uh, I've been a, I'm a board certified registered nurse. I'm a family nurse practitioner, uh, uh, providing primary care in this region um, in an integrated clinic. Uh, I, I have certifications in integrated primary care behavioral health as well as trauma-informed care and really uh, am driven by the need to improve uh, access to care, coordination of care, knowing that uh, primary care is uh, a lot of the times the first contact uh, for uh, patients, 
uh, or clients that need help. And um, I'm just really happy to be a part of this uh, task force and hope we can get some good things done. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Are, are there any other members of the subcommittee on Zoom who did not identify themselves in the chat box? Uh, hi, Aubrey. Bob, person. Shortly, I didn't want to interrupt introductions, but I had a, an appointment before this meeting that I had to come from. Um, but I'm the advocacy and outreach coordinator for the Colorado Mental Wellness Network, um, and I'm also a person living with mental health conditions. Um, and I feel that when we're making decisions about my community and my own care, um, that we should get to be involved in that process. So that's why I'm here. Thanks, Aubrey. So in the interest of time, we're going to um, have the public um, introduce themselves as a group a little bit so that we can dig into some of the work that we have coming up this afternoon. So just as a show of hands in the room um, from the members of the public, can you raise your hand if you're a, a provider? <laughs> and what about a consumer? And then um, a representative of the state government and your agency. Great. And I appreciate your patience in, um, with the introductions in terms of members of the public. We're so appreciative that you're here and want to hear your voice to participate in some of the work that we're going to do this afternoon. And we want to get into that. So, um, so we're going to shorten that section a little bit and pass to the communications team from um, CDHS. Yes, Robert. There will be time for public comment at the end of the agenda. Absolutely, yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Techmeyer. I'm Director of Communications for CDHS. And you've heard the word excitement over and over, but from a communication side of things, we cannot tell you how excited we are. Because this is an opportunity you don't really get in a career to be part of something that changes history. And uh, we're pretty bubbly about it. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm blessed with a, a robust team. Um, um, Madeline Rubel, who's my Deputy Director of Communications. We have uh, Cohen Pert in the room walking around with the camera. Uh, he's Digital Communications. And we have Shannon Mulhall, who's also our internal communications there. And that's just kind of the team that has put together the start of this communications plan uh, or this whole operation. We have also uh, engaged with many communication uh, professionals from different state agencies. Um, and we are meeting with them on a bi-weekly basis. If any of you have communications people that um, you think should be involved in this, we would love to have them uh, be part of the communications team. Uh, we are involving as many hands on deck as we can. We've developed a, a really robust comms plan that we're very proud of, but also looking for input to uh, make it even better. So um, with that said, um, Maddie is kind of driving our day-to-day -day with this, so I'll turn it over to her. But um, we are open to any suggestions, and we are putting stuff out daily. So we've already tweeted a couple times this morning, and so Maddie will go in to ask you for your involvement in that. But this is definitely going to be a team effort, um, and we want to build excitement out there like has not been seen in communications for behavioral health in the past. So thank you. So who received our newsletter on Monday? Everybody has their hand up, right? If anybody did not receive it, please let us know. You can also sign up on the website. Um, you guys must be getting this newsletter. So if there's a problem with somebody not getting it, we want to get you on there ASAP. The next one is coming um, in two weeks. So you'll see them uh, bi-weekly in your inbox. If you're not seeing it, again, please, please, please let us know. So a couple of the big places we can find information from us before we start asking for information and uh, uh, deliverables from you. Um, first stop is always the website. So I think Cohen has been updating it almost every day. That's where um, we're keeping it really all of the latest information. We know that there are many updates with the meetings um, for all of the committees, so please look there first. Um, if the newsletter doesn't have it, the website is probably the most recent since that's a little bit quicker than, than a bi-weekly newsletter. Um, follow us on social, please, pretty please. Um, we are at Colorado BHTF. 
Um, you can also follow CDHS and many of the other um, agencies and organizations that we work with will hopefully also be sharing our stuff. So um, start with the, the BHTF social website, both on Twitter and Facebook, um, and then we'll go from there. In the newsletter, um, if you didn't receive it, anybody else around the room, please sign up. But in there, you can expect to see um, previous minutes, right? We have to do our due diligence and what's discussed here. So we'll have those on the website so that you can access them. Um, send it to your friends, just anybody that wants to be informed on what happens in this room. Um, we'll have big victories that we're working on. Um, we have some media coverage in there. We have some stats in there. We're hoping to work up to getting some profiles of you guys and other committees. We know there's a lot of people in this room. There's a lot of interested parties and there's a, quite a few people on every committee. So um, we know they're large groups, but we want you to feel like you know each other and know the other groups and what's happening. Um, we're also open to ideas. So as you start getting them and we um, get a rhythm going, if there's things that you wish you saw, please send it over. If there's something that you hate, please tell us that too. Um, definitely open to suggestions and changes and ideas there. Um, as some uh, general housekeeping in terms of communication, we will probably be prepping you guys for interviews in some way with media. Um, so be prepared for that. If you're absolutely not interested, also good to know. We don't want to do anything that you're not comfortable with, but um, just so that we're all on the same page, singing the same song, if you are contacted by media, and you very well may be, this is exciting, and we're trying to create that excitement, um, please let us know, both just for um, some consistency so we can help you prep, help you feel prepared, help you speak on the behalf of yourself, the people that you're representing, and also the people in this room. Um, so we'll, we want to help you, and we also want to make sure that we capture every single time that you guys are in the media to show everybody else, and we put that in the newsletters so other committees can see what's being discussed. Please um, send the newsletter to your friends, um, send it to your family, send it to anybody that wants to know, talk about what's happening here, um, and, and help us do that, please. So. Next, the biggest ask for today, as you see the comms team wandering around. Um, in the newsletter, you probably saw the mashup video with Michelle and some other members of the executive committee. We're going to start taking those videos at probably every meeting of you guys, everybody in this room, so you guys don't get to put your heads down in the back. Um, we'll be getting videos of everybody. So start thinking now about um, the theme for today. The question we're going to ask is, what are your two words for your excitement to be on the committee, your excitement about the task force in general? So as we're setting this up, the four of us, Mark, myself, Shannon, and Cohen will be going around. Um, please say something like, I'm excited about the task force. My two words for the task force are excited and ready to roll, something like that. They're two words. Um, keep it really short. We're going for, if anybody's familiar with Snapchat, you're, like, you're less than 10 seconds so that we can stack some videos and do mashups. Any questions on any of that? Okay. One thing I want to just mention is that our communications on this is going to be video heavy. Um, it's, it sells, it moves, it gets attention, and people love it. So the mashup she was talking about, but also we want to hear from consumers. So if you have consumers that are willing to be on camera and talk about their journey uh, and the challenges, we are um, really interested in doing that so that we can include them as well, not just uh, the interviews with you guys and everyone else, but the people who are affected by this work the most, the ones that we are here to help. So if you have any suggestions, uh, please let us know. Thank you. All right, we're gonna give everybody an opportunity to stand up and stretch, take a minute to breathe, move slowly so you don't start sweating more. And we're gonna, but we're gonna shorten the break to five minutes so that we can um, get back and um, get to work together. So 10, 20. Move slowly. <laughs>
So we are going to um, do a little bit of uh, forming, as they say, uh, before we do a little bit of storming and then hopefully performing in the next couple of meetings. Um, but really want to do some uh, level setting and, again, um, develop some common understandings of how we're going to work together um, and um, kind of some mutually agreed upon um, guidelines or rules or expectations for the group and, and how we're going to function. So uh, appreciating that everyone comes at this from very, very different perspectives and how that is going to be a strength for this group. Um, certainly, uh, there are potential financial or business uh, implications um, that could be affected as part of this work. Um, so to be honest and, and to recognize that and to acknowledge that. Um, Additionally, so many of us wear multiple hats. I'm no exception to that. Um, so but just a, a, a common understanding and, and realization and appreciation that um, even as individuals, we have multiple lenses and multiple perspectives from which we approach this work. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it might be helpful um, to identify which hat or which lens or which um, perspective you're offering um, when making a comment or a suggestion or a recommendation. Um, and then of course there's history, right? There's um, you know, been reference um, of, of this work. Um, there's been reference made to this work going all the way back to the 60s. Um, so there's a lot of history in the room um, for better or worse. Um, so again, just uh, hopefully having a recognition of that, appreciation of that, um, hopefully uh, the, uh, looking at that as the opportunity to take lessons learned. Um, from our history and uh, again how to shape the best way to move forward. I, I think I would also say, um, you know, despite the different hats and, and the diversity and it, it, not despite, um, uh, as a strength of this group, um, the diversity and the breadth of um, community organizations that are represented in this room, um, I, I think that is a strength of this group, and I think it's important to recognize that we all probably have way more in common than we have um, than we disagree on. Um, and so, to keep that at the forefront and to uh, elicit from each other and solicit from each other some of the common ideas and common, solu common solutions that everyone can go ahead and get around or get behind. Um, these are some of the assumptions that we've presented to the task force at large, as well as the long term competency subcommittee. Um, and uh, we would like to offer these as, again, uh, loose team operating agreements or sub subcommittee operating agreements that um, folks can agree upon um, and um, uh, get behind in terms of some of the norms or um, expectations for how this group is going to function. Um, so these would include, um, you know, the recognition and appreciation that we're all here for the right reason and everybody wants to do right by the patients. Uh, consumers, population, individuals that we're trying to serve. Um, we want to make sure that everyone participate, participates, including members of the public. Um, we want to welcome that voice and involve that voice um, uh, and, and hear from everyone. Um, and so we will do our best, the best that we can as facilitators to make sure that, that the tone of the room and the flow of the meetings are inclusive of everyone. And, um, we're able to kind of capture the ideas of everyone. Um, and at the same time, we want to be tough on ideas and soft on people. We want to be curious. We want to, um, again, solicit solutions or, or elicit recommendations from each other. Um, and as has been mentioned before, uh, I think maybe Nancy or others before, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be okay to, to, to agree to disagree. Um, again, acknowledging your role and what hat uh, or, 
or sort of what lens or, or primary perspective you're approaching this work from. Um, and that may vary, of course, throughout the course of the meetings. Um, again, to say very, very solution oriented, um, we could probably um, speak for days and weeks and months about what might be wrong with the system and get nowhere. So to really, really stay solution focused and, and keeping um, the, what we're, the aim, what we're working towards in terms of doing right by the population uh, of Coloreds that we're trying to serve and, and how to best do that. Uh, of course, we'll start and end on time. Um, use word and we will also use words thoughtfully and respectfully as they sort of touched on before. Um, so again, we want to present these as uh, sort of loose guidelines and make it clear that we are very, very open to hearing additional solutions and recommendations um, for how we're going to work together um, and sort of the mutually agreed upon expectations. I will also say that the Farley Health Policy Center wants to serve as um, a conduit uh, between you all as members of the public, certainly the subcommittee members with the co-chairs and with you all as subcommittee members and behavioral health task force at large. Um, so questions, concerns, points of clarification, um, any kind of communication that you want to pass along, uh, the Farley Center would like to receive that um, and then pass it along to Summer and again, chair CDH, CDHS and the task force at large. In general. And we have time to uh, ask for additions to this list now. So, um, Lauren. So, the use words thoughtfully, be respectful. I think we need to understand that we're creating a system for people um, and that we need to always use person centered language. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that the Mental Wellness Network has a great guideline for how to speak when we're talking about people um, who utilize this system. Um, and so maybe that's a, something that you send a, out to all of the committee members that people die by suicide, people don't commit suicide, suicide is not a crime. Um, those types of things so that we're always using person-centered language when we're talking. Thank you so much for that, Lauren. And that had been brought up at the, the larger behavioral health task force in our initial kickoff meeting. Um, and we are planning to be very, very intentional around that, including um, even providing some type of instruction materials maybe um, from Aubrey's shop. Um, but but absolutely couldn't agree more. And uh, I think that's absolutely a common theme and, and recommendation throughout the, all the groups. Other questions, suggestions, recommendations? Um, the one thing that, in my experience, that I'd like to just bring to the group is that we all in agreement that we leave our preconceived um, notions or, or even our prejudices out of here to where we don't look at, uh, I deal with this in law enforcement all the time, where they look at caseworkers from DHS as, you know, the, the soft and cuddly social workers and I'm like, and, and I'm like, they're a lot tougher than you guys are. <laughs> and on the other reverse side is that cops have no heart when we don't care about these people. And I will tell you that culture is changing as well. The law enforcement wants to be part of the solution. So just leave our, you know, just be open to everybody in this room. Cause I guess that first one is right. Everybody's here to do the right thing. Very good, thank you for that. Other thoughts? And certainly open to um, additional ideas, thoughts, recommendations, and or concerns. Feel, please feel free to come uh, through the Farley Center for such things. Thanks, Jonathan, and good morning again, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to, to work with all of you. I've had a chance to work with a number of you in different ways before. Um, I helped to get the Colorado Health Access Fund off the ground that started out of the Denver Foundation. Um, last year, I worked and facilitated the Crisis Steering Committee, um, so it's great to see a lot of familiar faces in the room. Also great to see a lot of folks that have come of traveling a long ways to be here, uh, and we really appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I think is most exciting about this work is that it is rare that you have alignment of all the stars. 
right? We have true political will starting at the very top to say, tell us how we have a behavioral health system that works for everybody. We know that's working for some people right now. It's not working for everybody. What are the changes that need to happen in order for that to occur? Um, and that doesn't always happen. You don't always get like a, tell us every crazy idea that you have and let's figure out how to make it work. Um, that's pretty rare, you know? And so I think especially with this subcommittee, it's what makes this work so special and what's also gonna make it so hard, right? Um, one of the ways that I love to talk about the work of this task force, of this subcommittee, is that as I've been going out and around and saying, tell me what other states are doing this really well. Um, tell me what other states we should look to as models. I hear a lot of Virginia is doing this well, Massachusetts is doing this well, Washington State is doing this piece well, but nobody has a comprehensive system, right? Um, and I want Colorado to be the state that everybody looks to. It's not gonna happen in two years, it's not gonna happen in three years, but in five years, seven years, I want everyone across the US to say Colorado figured it out. Um, and that's why this work is so important. That's why we have you meeting every two weeks. That's why you're going to be doing work in between the meetings every two weeks. Um, so just to be really clear, in case you haven't heard it already, this is going to be a pretty heavy lift. Um, so we are really excited that you all are committed to, to being here with us today um, and to making this happen. Just to go over a little bit about the work of the task force. Um, so I think everybody knows we've got three subcommittees, uh, children's, long-term competency, and of course the safety net. Hopefully you all know why you're here today. Um, what's gonna happen is that all that hard work is gonna be done here. Um, you all will provide recommendations to the task force. Robert and Nancy as the co-chairs, are serving as ex officio members of the task force. So they are also going to every task force meeting, which is meeting once a month, to share updates that are coming out of this subcommittee, to share recommendations. Um, and then the task force will kind of ask the questions, help connect the dots, um, and look at, you know, what are some other things that we should be thinking about. This is the structure as of right now. Um, this is also subject to change. So as we get into this work, right, if we say, gosh, we need to, fit, we need to pick figure out this other piece. We need to focus on this other area. We have the flexibility to do that. We can add other subcommittees if we need to. We can change a little bit of the focus of the work. So there is that flexibility and adaptability. That being said, I think it's really um, fair to say that when we produce a blueprint in June of next year, um, it's not gonna be a, here's the full fix of the entire system that we need to implement over the next three years. It's gonna be, here's phase one right and here's the big steps that we need to take um so we are probably going to come up with things that are going to go in the parking lot that we're not going to be able to necessarily address immediately but what i envision in that blueprint is here's all the work that's going to be done for the three years and then in phase two here's the other pieces that we need to start looking at and digging into so i just want to kind of be clear on some of those expectations um the great news and i think it was referenced earlier there has been a lot of work done around behavioral health in Colorado over the past couple of years. We have a lot of great places to start from. We have lots of data, we have lots of reports, we have lots of recommendations. We're gonna talk about the witchy report here in a little bit. Um, we have a great place to start. What I would love to see and how I envision the blueprint being a little bit different than what we've had in, or than what we see in some of those other reports is that there's gonna be that accountability piece. Right, so in June of next year, we will have a blueprint that says, here's our recommendations for the first three years, year by year. Here's the funding, here's the public policy, here's the staffing, and most importantly, here's who is, who's responsible for the implementation, whether it's HICPUC, whether it's CDHS, whether it's our community partners, um, it's gonna be really clear. So if we fast forward to two years from now, in June 2021, when the governor says, what progress have we made, and if we haven't made some progress, why not? We can really specifically go to that blueprint and say, here's where we got stuck, um, here's who it was responsible for, and let's have a collective conversation about how we can help move the ball forward. So I just wanted to kind of set some expectations around this uh, subcommittee and task force and how we're gonna be working. Any questions about that? Robert, Nancy, anything that you all wanna add? Sorry, I keep having yeah, no, to say things. Uh, so the safety net system is supposed to serve kids as well. How, who's doing that work? Is it the children's subcommittee or us? And yeah. 
great question. So we're going to get into definitions a little bit today. I think we do anticipate that there's going to be overlap between, among all of this, right? Like this work can't happen, these conversations can't happen in silos. I think as we get into that work, we'll be starting to talk about how do we want to make sure that we are connecting all those dots and who is responsible for what. We have too much work to do to duplicate work and conversations. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so just going forward, um, just a couple of logistics. We, I think Nancy referenced this earlier, everyone should receive the expectations and guidelines. Um, if you have it on hand with you today, I think there's copies in your folder or we have extra copies available at the table over here. Um, you can go ahead and sign it. If you haven't signed it, don't worry, you will be hearing from us. Um, we will follow up with you because we wanna make sure that you're really clear on what this um, commitment is. The other thing that I will share with you around the commitment um, that we're asking is just to be really action oriented. You heard a little bit from the communications team about kind of sharing the work of the task force in different ways uh, and the subcommittee. The other piece that we really wanna ask you is that in your communities, if there's groups that are already meeting, if there's stakeholders that you wanna have pulled together, um, do that. Um, we want to see you do that <laughs> to the degree that myself or one of the executive committee members or a couple of our subcommittee members can come together and be there and help um, facilitate and support. That's great. But we really want to make sure that this work is getting out to everybody across the entire state. I'm planning to be on the road a lot, but we also need help from all of you to help make that happen. Um, and so that we can go out and tell and say to the communities and to the different populations that we're all working with, what is working? What isn't working? What recommendations and solutions do you have so that you can bring them back to this subcommittee as well? So I want to make sure to put that out there. Um, you also should have received the boards and commissions training. So that's been circulated. So if you have not completed that yet, please do so. Again, if you have not done it, I'm sure you'll be hearing from us. So you can expect to hear that. Um, and then we've got travel guidelines in your folder for those of you, because I know a lot of you have traveled really far. If you need travel reimbursement, please just talk to us and let us know, and we can um, talk to you a little bit about how to make that happen. Any questions about the logistics? Okay, moving right ahead. Uh, I'm just gonna stay up here and uh, move into the next one, yes. So we have shared as pre readings for all of you, uh, legislation SB 19222, which is focusing on the safety net system, as well as the WICHU report. We're going to spend a couple minutes going over it right now. Um, we're not going to spend a ton of time diving into all the details, um, and that's because we just have a lot of other work to, that we need to do. We want to get into those conversations. So um, when we send out this pre reading materials, again, that's one of the things we're just going to ask you please take that seriously. Please read it. Um, even report, that's totally okay. <laughs> um, we want to be realistic, but uh, doing that pre reading will help us ensure that we can have a more productive conversation and really make good use of our time here. Um, so, with that, just yes. be careful of that cord. No, I'm okay. Okay, I'll try not to move around as much. No, you can move, I just see it. <laughs> I don't want you to fall. Um, so, one of the things I just want to start with is talking about the definition of behavioral health. Um, it is in the legislation, but just kind of in general and layman's terms, how we're talking about behavioral health within the task force and the subcommittees is that it's really focused on both um, mental health and substance use disorder. So I think that's really important to stress, and it is kind of the, that is the umbrella term that we're using for behavioral health is the umbrella term that we're using for mental health and substance use disorder. Robert, you want to note the lieutenant governor asked that we also consider all addictions, um, when we need, when we'll talk about this as well, uh, gambling addictions mm -hmm. and other addictions that we may not, mm -hmm. you know, these are the two prevalent, but there are other types of addictions that she asked that we need to keep in mind. Okay. Just, now I'm going to get nervous about this. Board. I can do that for you if you want me to. Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to spend just a couple minutes going over uh, SP 19222. Um, that just to give you an overview of kind of what that legislation said. Um, first, that anyone who has a behavioral health disorder should not have to enter the criminal justice system. Um, that, of course, means that uh, 
if that happens, it results in poor outcomes, right? And it's really costly. So to the degree that we can make sure that that does not happen is what is what part of the work that we're doing here. Um, Lauren mentioned children and youth with behavioral health needs, anyone who is at risk of or involved with um, juvenile justice system, child welfare, we want to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks. And again, some of that work will happen and will, those conversations will happen with the, um, the children's subcommittee. The safety net should not allow individuals with behavioral health disorders to be turned away from treatment. Um, and until or unless they no longer require services, we need to make sure that they're getting the help and the services that they need. And then the last one, um, we need to make sure that there's adequate services in every um, region of the state. So those are especially with uh, individuals who have the most difficult treatment disorders, regardless of where they live, they need to be able to access and make sure that they have uh, services. Robert, is there anything you wanna add? Yeah, please read the uh, Senate Bill 19 222. Um, um, you can provide a copy. It really does lay out the chart for us. It gives us an, end, uh, an ultimate end date of, of 2024, but we'd like to get this rolling before then. Uh, uh, it does talk about high intensity services, so uh, make sure that we are paying attention to uh, that as well. Um, it does require sort of identifying when you have a conflict of interest, which we already discussed. And I would just read it because it does kind of lay out a, a framework, um, talks about viability of the system. It's only a couple pages, it's worth the read. And I don't know if Lauren, the Mental Colorado basically uh, wrote the bill, so I don't know if there's more you want to say from behalf of your organization on 222. No, I think the focus was if you are a uh, homeless individual, homeless individual that our system should be meeting you where you're at. We should have intensive services that um, are sort of into the community. Um, you shouldn't be turned away from services just because it's a, yeah. yeah. And I have a comment. And that is um, one of the things that I'm really aware of is equity. And we haven't used that word yet, but um, that last statement on the previous slide, I think, mentioned that and across across Colorado, um, we, we should be equitable. Not equal, but equitable, so that everybody has the opportunities that are available in the metro area. The other thing that I'll just point out real quickly is that as you're looking at the legislation, it's um, I read it almost as somewhat divided into two parts. There's uh, kind of this role um, or responsibilities for the Department of Human Services, and then there's HICPOC that has some roles and responsibilities as well. It's in terms of looking at um, incentives for providers to accept Medicaid recipients, whether that's um, looking at higher reimbursement rates or whatnot, um, and looking at demonstration labor. So there's that piece of it that I think that's just important for you to know that there's like a HICPOC piece and a CDHS piece. Of course, we're working together to make sure that that's all happening um, seamlessly, but I think that's just important to know because as you're reading through the legislation, uh, it's not completely clear, so it could be a little bit confusing um, as you're looking at it. And the other thing, um, Robert, I just want to check in with you. Is there anything that you want to say in terms of um, access to inpatient civil debts and that piece of it? We don't have enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, uh, and it's not when you think of civil beds, when you think of the entire system, the you know, AT, the Q treatment units that mental health centers run, crisis stabilization units, private hospitals. What is the opportunity here, other than just building more state beds, to think about the full continuum um, and what the, the roles are and the different types of beds we have? Um, one thing we do not really have in Colorado that includes the, the state hospital, at least for the civil side, on the Forensic side, we, we have the capacity to do this, but on the civil side, for, for folks that are displaying aggressive behaviors, that's still something that this group, and it's mentioned in legislation, it's something this group needs to talk about. Uh, other states have, um, Arizona being one, and we're talking about this, the Long-Term Competency Committee has developed sort of secure treatment units uh, that allow um, sometimes, um, with heavy, heavy oversight needed, um, that how to help uh, treat aggressive folks without getting clinicians injured um, is something that we need to address in Colorado as well. That's one of the bad, I think later on today we're gonna talk about a lot of reasons why people don't get care. Uh, but that, that's one that's, and there's a list in here as well. So, um, but for civil beds, 
Uh, yeah, we need more. Uh, the forensic bets, for those that don't know, we're under a lawsuit. Um, we're, we're, we're getting, last month we paid $1.12 million in fines. Uh, we'll continue to pay that in fines uh, while we get the forensics uh, situation. That's The forensic situation is essentially, those who go to court, uh, their, their cognitive or, or mental or behavioral um, uh, condition that they're, they're struggling with is interfering with their ability to understand the court process. The state is court ordered to serve those folks, uh, educate them, um, restore them, what's the word, to uh, competency so that they understand the court process and can have a fair judicial process. Um, we are just overwhelmed. Uh, every month we probably get 100 new referrals about uh, for folks to get restored. And it's and it's then they're with us for three to four months. So you can imagine it's just stacking, um, and it's increased by about twelve hundred percent since the year two thousand. Number of referrals. I bring this up here because to me, and this is you know my hypothesis, that's happening because we 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 need a more adequate safety net system, right? There are too many people even getting to court on misdemeanors, petty offenses, stealing a candy bar, taking a bike, uh, who are actively psychotic. Um, but they don't have the secure treatment place or, or the right services they need. And sometimes they are too aggressive for a private provider to, to, to manage uh, or they're, they're a safety risk. Um, and that's why they keep turning to law enforcement it's for the public safety component, because there's two sides, right? We, we have to consider the person's treatment. We also have to consider the public safety as well. Um, and that's the challenge for this group. I think if we just get it right here, we'll help solve that problem. With that said, we solve that other problem. We will be able to turn those forensic beds into civil beds. Uh, we're, we're gaining a hundred plus new beds through this lawsuit. Uh, the legislators gave us money. Uh, is my long-term goal to eventually get those beds back to civil if we can get the forensic demand down. So it may not be a need of more money for more civil beds. It may be a need of reducing the number of people going to jail with mental health so we can convert those beds back to civil. And the one thing I want to uh, point out, and I'm glad you brought it up, is that the impact this is having across the board, it's not just the state's problem, it's everybody in this room's problem because those referrals and their backlog, those people are all sitting in county jails waiting to get up there. And we've got people sitting in jails for six to seven to eight months waiting to get up there. And these people, and the, and the justice system stops until this happens. So we have men and women sitting in jails who are not getting in my opinion, the rights met because they're sitting there in jail waiting to get restored back to competency just so they can go to court. Um, and it's, uh, so it's not a state's problem, it's everybody's problem because it's, it's that ripple effect, it's hurting everybody. It's also US Supreme Court's uh, opinion that they're not getting their rights met too, that's why I run. <laughs> yeah, they made that pretty clear. <laughs> to ask because I haven't heard anything about brain injuries and so I was curious if this would cover uh, traumatic brain injury as well because uh, I've seen statistics um, in prison and jails that 70% of folks um, have had TBI so is that covered? With I rolled that into cognitive when I mentioned earlier about the, the lawsuit but yes I, I agree I think that's going to be the other it, uh, barriers that we talk about is, is TBI and um, other medical conditions that are related um, that have a behavioral component uh, absolutely needs to be on the table. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're stuck where we are is the understanding of, of co-occurring um, diagnoses, whether it be mental, behavioral, or medical. Okay, because uh, with housing, a lot of times what happens is we see when people fall through the cracks, and when someone doesn't quite meet the definition of something they go to another system and then there's disagreement between the two system of who's going to be served and then we can't house them so. uh question sarah and then frank i just wanted to add too that i would like us to keep the focus on making sure the continuum of care is culturally accessible that doesn't just mean language line, that means a lot of different things. And so that every person who's seeking care, whether it's in crisis or not, feels uh, comfortable and welcome in the environment they're going into. And I think we have a lot of work to do in that area still. Thank you. Uh, just real quickly, I just want to support something, Carl, I think you mentioned in your introduction, it really resonated with me and something I've been talking about with, you know, as far as you have a public health and uh, population health crisis and I, you know, 
So I know the focus of the safety net is sort of downstream and we need to make sure people aren't falling through the cracks and need institutionalization settings like ho hospitals or uh, jail settings, but maybe it's just that, you know, re-emphasis back to the task force that we need to figure out how to turn, turn off the faucet of people coming in and needing high intensity services. Uh, so just make that uh, request again and pitch for the, the larger task force as we try to you know look at what's the right mix of institution beds and and high intensity services we part of what i think our centers are experiencing is the volume and the nature of the need and we need to figure out and you mentioned the number one economy in the country and uh, cclp just put out a, a good report you might not sort of get the connection and right away um, but they have they put out a report every couple of years on the self efficiency standard and Colorado is really struggling so despite the fact that we're number one they are the number one economy in the country it's not working for everybody and if you look at the stats on you know how we're following behind I think it mirrors the trends in suicide mental health uh, opioid overdose um, so so again I mean I think I know that's the probably the focus more for the task force and we're more of a downstream focus but um, something's not working. Our community system and our state system is stretched to the max and we sort of have to figure out how do we shut the faucet off um, so people don't need the services that we're going to try to uh, figure out how to uh, expand. Thank you. Uh, Rick, last comment and then yeah. we're going to move on to the well, what's your report. You know, I think we have the number one economy, but we also have Tabor. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's the sort of the 800 pound gorilla in the room too that we have to deal with. So. Good. Robert, were you going to say something? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to bring no. it up, but no. <laughs> to Frank's comment, I completely agree. I think we have we have to look at both. Nothing says a safety net has to be for highest intensities, but we can't look at prevention. For me, you can't look at prevention at the expense of not correcting the back end of the system as well. So. That's why it's a system. Yep. Any other specific questions around the legislation before we move into the witchery report? And I'm just moving us along because we don't have a lot of time. Okay, great. Let's move on. <laughs> um, so we did share the witchery report with you. Um, this is something that the Office of Behavioral Health asked to be done in 2015 to kind of inform their future strategic planning. Obviously, that was four years ago. There's a lot that has changed over the last four years, to put it mildly. Um, and at the same time, there is, uh, I think, some things that are still, or recommendations that came out of the Witcher Report that are still important for us to know and to be thinking about as we're um, <coughs> doing the work of the Safety Committee. So we um, are not going to go into a lot of detail, um, just because we don't have a lot of time we want to get into some group discussion, so we're not just talking at you. Um, but just a couple of recommendations that I think are relevant for the subcommittee um, that came out of the Witcher Report. The first one being just looking at the populations across the state. Since 2015, um, the state population has already risen about 300,000, over 300,000 people. Um, and so being really thoughtful about how are we addressing the needs for services equitably across the state as the population has changed. Um, is one of the things that came out of the Witcher Report. Again, that was a couple years ago. Looking at um, the payer, oh, go ahead, Robert. I need to make a quick comment because I did read all 700 pages. Um, <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean that, that it's an equal dollar per capita um, for everybody in the state because we know that the, if you do that with rural rural suffers, if you do just a, a, an equal dollar per capita. So there, there are things that we need to figure out, and particularly the state level between the state agencies, is having consistent formula on how we apply funds. Uh, and speaking of, of Tabor or political stuff, I mean, we, we tend to get some folks that want to get their projects in there or they, they represent a region. And then over time, it becomes sort of uh, not consistent. And I'm a data guy, so I, I love the standardized approach of allocations. I think it's something at some point uh, we should talk about. I know we're probably going to bring this up in the larger behavioral health task force about funding structures, because uh, there's no committee really dedicated to finance and funding structures. Uh, but I think that's important here on this recommendation is that there are so many different formulas, uh, maybe getting more consistent on what that is. Um, yeah, no, thank, thank you. And I think that uh, in terms of even just the funding and, and the next piece of the, the payer piece, 
um, that is one of the things that our financial office has started to do at CHS is kind of looking at, we've got some data around where the funding streams are coming in across Colorado for behavioral health. Um, so we're looking at updating that and seeing if we can get some more detailed information um, so that we can share that because that will help us figure out where it's coming in. Then we can start looking at how it's going out and are we using dollars as efficiently as possible. Um, so that is something that I think we'll be talking about across all of the subcommittees and the task force as well. Um, the other pieces that I think came, the other Sorry. <laughs> the other pieces that came out of the witchery report is just making sure that we um, should be, for individuals with significant co-occurring needs, um, making sure that they have um, the support services that they need. A lot of times that comes in back to kind of workforce experiences, so how are we thinking about um, approaching that differently? Um, Robert mentioned earlier, kind of everything's on the table. Uh, even with the state agencies. So one of the, re the report or the recommendations coming out of which we report was looking at um, a single state behavioral health entity. So uh, does it make sense to have OBH within CDHS and have HICPA um, as separate entities right now? So that's been uh, I think an ongoing conversation and a conversation that maybe we could bring to rest one way or another uh, throughout this work. Um, and then exploring the development of a common management information system. I think those conversations have started. Robert, I don't know if there's an uh, update that you want to give a little bit around that. I'm actually going to invite uh, Camille to come. Uh, she's the director for Division of Community Behavioral Health, and she's this is really her expert. I know they're working with uh, several partners on uh, medication consistency for folks in jail as they come out of jail. There's Compass. There's a number of different technology stuff, with the goal being uh, moving more and more towards integration of physical health, mental health data. Uh, so that we can better serve folks in, in a way. Obviously, Colorado being a very um, government state out of my business kind of state, uh, to turn balancing that, that privacy protection with uh, how we can better serve people by having more complete information. So I'll have Camille come. But I'll say for, for all these, uh, I would say that the, the uh, well, you didn't get that one, the implementation and suspension of rather than termination of Medicaid benefits is the only one that's pretty, you can really say we check the box on. Uh, for the most part, but. <laughs> not com not completely. So, um, I, when you asked me earlier, um, we've done it effectively for, for prison corrections. Um, we haven't done it effectively, I think, at the the county level, um, and we uh, are continuing to explore um, the opportunity of doing it with our state hospitals as well. So that's helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> at the at the national level, I've been part of a committee to. Um, to lobby against um, or for this, um, that that's a problem across the across the country. So there is a a lot of people trying to work on this one. Yeah, and I agree. Um, and there's a lot of federal regs that come into this, but that's just to me not a kind of, we can't do it. It's just uh, how we get clever and, and do it within the fed, federal regs because I don't want to wait for four to six years to have federal legislation passed. Um, so I guess we could say none of them really checked. Um, so, um, and some of the information in the report, if you're reading it, it, it does a little outdated, the ACA, the structures, uh, the fin financing structures around Medicaid has changed since then. Um, but we got a ways to go on these things and an opportunity. Um, I, I think when you read the report, or at least when I read the report, there's stuff, there's sections where like check, we did this small little thing here that checks that box, a small little thing over here that checks box, that box, but nothing felt like we did it cohesively together. So there's a system improvement versus we address this issue through this one project versus we address this issue by modifying the system. I do it. Um, I didn't read the whole report so thank you for doing that. Um, I have one question and I don't mean to throw a hot topic into this room and don't have to go into it a lot right now but in the witch report there's no exclusion to people who are going to serve because our focus is on people. So, is that correct? So irregardless of their immigration status, if they need services, services are, will be provided. Yeah, it's that's not addressed in the, in the report directly. Um, when we talk about, oh, and, and all the things you read when, when the definitions of safety net, it, it, it really, it doesn't talk about legal status. It talks about those who can and those who cannot pay, right? 
um, which is a little outdated in itself too, because those that do have insurance and can pay, their co-pays are so high that they struggle, and you can't get providers to, to serve them either because their reimbursement's low in the private insurance sector. So that even that term's sort of outdated. So we are real to redefine what safety net means. Um, it doesn't address legal status. It also wasn't the hot political topic, I think, in 2014 that it is today. Um, so. I can I can talk loudly or Perfect. well I just I I looked at this report and I didn't read the whole thing I looked through it but I did do a search on the word fetal or fetal alcohol syndrome fetal um, alcohol spectrum disorder it's not mentioned now this researched by the National Institute of Crudis not there because they're ending up in jail, they're ending up in the street. And I'd really <coughs> like to not leave these people out. A lot of times they don't, they appear more capable than they are. And this is what my son his his issue do. Uh, so just wanted to point that out. Seven hundred pages and no mention of that at all. And yeah, and you're correct, the report doesn't really get into detail on different diagnoses and different high functioning, uh, it, it used the word undiagnosed or unrecognized diagnoses um, pretty broadly. So in the interest of time, um, I put up here kind of, if you read the report, there are lots of recommendations across other areas that we're probably all familiar with, some of which are more prominent now than they probably were four or five years ago, telehealth, peer mentors. Um, Housing, I don't think affordable housing conversation is going to go away anytime soon. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these because uh, we're going to spend some time as a, in small groups talking about the definition of safety net. Um, but I just want to make sure that everyone is on everyone's radar and check in and see if there are any other kind of questions or comments about around the WICHI report. <coughs> Chris, real quick. This was done in 2014, 15, and some things have been implemented. What's the, what's taken the time? To do it. So, Robert, I'm going to pass that back to you. <coughs> um, not the scapegoat. It was done as a needs analysis. Um, that's and actually that's a great point because that's what we want this community to be different, right? We wanted to say not only is this something we need to do, and we mentioned earlier who's doing it, but um, this is this is how it gets done, right? And we might need to bring other folks in, um, you know, uh, from different payer sources. I mean, having him come through is great for that. Uh, as far as how it gets done. I mean, that's the, uh, that's the part I'd like us to tackle too, not just a, this is what we need, right. and we, here's a concept. Um, it's a, this is how we do it, and this is who's gonna do it. I think those two parts you don't see in a lot of uh, reports and committees, and that's, I'd like this community different by, by addressing the how. It will be different, just to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> And just to speak to it a little bit um, from a state perspective as well, I wouldn't want to say that no work has been done. I think what's been missing is a structured state strategy around this so that we're doing it a little bit more effectively. So I can look into each of these areas and I can cite some things that we have done um, at HIPHUB as well as CDHS has done. I think it's that structured approach that we're really missing that hopefully this will bring. And hopefully we'll hopefully we'll have an opportunity for all of us who don't know all the parts um, to get educated so that as we move forward, we will be on the same page, so to speak. Um, we come in here today with lots of knowledge about our own stuff, but um, we are going to have to, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, come up with a common language and a, a common set of understandings. Um, those of us who haven't read the whole report, it's sitting in my car, but it's so thick. Um, at, least, at least let's try really hard to read the executive summary and, and maybe kind of glance through some of the chapters. Where is, the, could you just point out where, is that at the beginning? Because I looked at it, mm -hmm. just read the beginning. It's a little hard to tell, but it is the beginning of it. And actually the executive summary is pretty robust. Uh, you probably don't need to read the rest of the report unless you want to get, you want to geek out on data. Uh, but the executive summary is pretty robust, and we don't have to follow it either, right? We, it's it's acknowledgement that this has been raised and it's been raised again, again, and again, and that leads to you know we still believe in telehealth. Let's let's move forward with telehealth and figure out uh, how and who and why. Um, 
So yeah, and the executive summary is actually fine. I read the whole thing. The executive summary really does a good job of being thorough. Um, so I do think that to some of the comments, um, um, we should, for the providers of the safety net system, maybe have them come and present on the different types of systems, because I know there's different systems uh, throughout the state, but that includes emergency rooms, um, mental health centers, or, you know, each, each community looks a little different. Um, so maybe having a couple of those uh, of our providers presenting what it looks like today for them. Summer, can I just do a little housekeeping? If you can't get to a mic when you ask a question, Summer or Robert, can you repeat the question for those on sure. the phone? Everyone of us is probably going to be in that seat at some point, so we can start practicing. Or projecting loud and towards one of those little pucks, um, it should be good. Okay. But just in your loudest voice without yelling. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to the Bartley Center so that we can move to our next person. Great. Thanks, Summer. So um, now is the fun part where we get to do actually a little bit of work. And uh, um, I appreciate the discussion about and, and desire to get into the how probably before we get to that in subsequent meetings. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the what. Um, so everyone should have a worksheet um, in their um, packet uh, that has a list of really just three questions. Um, and the first is uh, to talk about um, the definition of the safety net and really what is it that we're talking about? What is the safety net and really what is the ideal um, for what the safety net should look like? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to divide up into probably five smaller groups um, uh, in, in, at the risk of uh, taking up time to do this. We'll probably count off by fives with subcommittee members and then um, disperse accordingly throughout the room and then most certainly want to invite members of the public to join those respective groups um, and be active and involved participants. Uh, in the discussion, and there are several worksheets. Um, if nobody has one, just let us know. Um, but the first question is, um, again, defining what are we talking about? What is the safety net? What is the ideal caveat or important caveat? I want to emphasize from the consumer perspective. Um, so it's not just what or, what or who are the member organizations who are providing the services, um, but from the consumer perspective, um, defining the safety net system. Um, and then the next two questions are really what would success look like for this subcommittee? Um, so you can think about it broadly and in more general terms. Um, and then the third question is what will measured success look like? Um, there was a mention of equity earlier. Equity is something that can be measured as in terms of rates of access and health disparities and so forth. Um, so, so we want to think, you know, kind of broadly and, and larger scale goals or 30,000 foot view and getting down, drilling down into the specifics of what would measured success, measured success look like. So, any clarification on this task? Robert. Uh, is anybody a coordinator or facilitate an online discussion? Great. Um, so for our Zoom participants, you will be virtually in um, small groups, and I will put you in those when we break with the large group. Other questions or points of clarification? So again, we want to try to move as quickly as, as we can. I know it's going to take up a little bit of time to um, shift around the room. I'm just going to be the housekeeping queen. So when you get into these groups, if you can um, kind of designate someone to take notes, we're going to collect these worksheets. It's a really nice way for us to be able to gather the thoughts of 25 to 50 people um, and take them back with us to synthesize. Um, and then someone who will report back out to the larger group when we reconvene. I'm going to ask you to count off by five. And um, I'm going to put group one over at this table. Group two can kind of convene right in here. Three and on this side of the existing kind of horseshoe, four at the front, and then five over at the side. But group five gets the candy, <laughs> so that's kind of exciting. So if you get five, you're in luck. So um, I'm sure Aubrey, can we start with you? We need to count out. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. 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 One. Two, three, four. Oh, then we need to go to the members of the public. So where do we stop? Four? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there 
anyone else? Or are you going to just say English? Okay. okay. So you're five. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> One. Two. Is it back there? No? Three. Four. All right. We did it. Um, so the ones are going to be over here, and then we're going to just go back around the room. I'll help kind of knit people together. I know that um, what's inspired you, what we heard from you this morning that inspired you to join the work of this group is really getting into these conversations and really starting to dig into the work. So I'm sorry we have to cut you off and then we did have more time to do that. But I'm going to start over here. Who's um, the reporter out there? All right, Nancy, I'm going to give you the subject um, I still have graduate student disease, so I took like four pages of notes. So um, bear with us. Um, I just want to say one of the issues that came up just now uh, was a really important one, and that is what do we call folks what I call them folks, I guess. Um, <laughs> individuals, individuals or folks or consumers or clients or what? How do we describe those individuals um, that we are talking about here? So that just came up and that might be something we want to talk about. Okay, thank you. Okay, definition of safety net. We got a lot of them. One of them is I can find what I need in a community that supports me. It's efficient and affordable. More than just the basics, it's easy to navigate, coordination is available, and I know where to go. There's no wrong door, I can get where I need, and I don't have to wait. It's seamless. There's, it, you can just move easily from one uh, to the other, and nobody says no. Now hang on. Page two. Uh, safety net um, can come to you, because I don't always know what I need. I don't know, always know what I want. And the environment is culturally sensitive and aware. And because I speak Urdu, there's somebody there who can um, help me. Um, it's available where I am, and it lets me remain where I want to be. And I have a choice if I want to accept services or not. And I want to make sure even if I have insurance, I can have access that's affordable. If I have a disability, I can get there and it feels safe so that when law enforcement is supportive, so that law enforcement is supportive and so it doesn't agitate me so I cross the line and uh, become involuntarily committed um, and that we have uh, transition services. I unfortunately go to jail and have to um, stay there. There's somebody waiting to help me when I get out. Want more? Well, if you got more, you've got the other ones. Yeah. The other ones we didn't have as much time. Um, what does success look like? We're, we've gotten to the how uh, with actionable implement, implementation uh, with folks that are accountable. There's buy in from the General Assembly and all of the stakeholders. Um, but first of all, we, we decided we need to define the problem. So, how do we know what we're trying to solve if we haven't discussed what it is? Is so uh, we want to start with defining the problem and then use quantitative and qualitative research. And then um, another way to define success is to um, listen to our consumers and they will say, hey, it's working, it's working. Okay, and how are we going to measure success? Those um, rankings that Robert was concerned with are going to improve a lot. Um, prevalence is going to go down. Um, uh, there's going to be an uh, increased percentage of people leaving various systems. 
we're going to um, turn competency bids into civil bids, and we're going to reduce the number of folks assessed for competence. That's all we got. Is there anything else from group four? Anyone else want to? Some time on the mic. All right, I'm coming over to group five. They made me be really bossy. I'm good at it. All right, so our definition, uh, a safety net system is a culturally informed and accessible, all-inclusive system that looks at whole health regardless of payer. A system that can effectively and seamlessly serve or coordinate the provision of services that meet all of a person's biopsychosocial needs in a timely manner. Everything they said was squished together. Okay. You want your paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and um, actually, we kept it pretty high level on what success for the subcommittee looks like. So, um, development of a structured, smart goal inspired plan with specific deliverables and timeframes. Um, and then uh, how we measure the success of that is monitoring it, the operationalization of that smart plan. Anything else from group three or five, sorry? Emma, are the folks on Zoom ready to go? I think so. Kyle is gonna report out for the Zoom. Um, All right, good. Kyle, you're on. Okay, thank you. So as we discussed um, uh, how to define a safety net there, uh, we're seeing things that came up very similar to what we've heard. So um, uh, the themes that came up is that we see a com uh, safety net as a, com a community-based service where individuals can receive services in the communities that they, um, let me fix my notes, that they live in, where they can have support from their families or their identified family. Uh, along with this same thought of the community, uh, the safety net uh, should be embedded into the community uh, and the state with support uh, to the agencies and entities uh, that are being uh, that they're being supported to whatever degree is possible to be able to deliver the care that they are delivering. Uh, we we saw safety net also as in, improving timeliness of access to care, uh, essentially looking at and coming up with solutions to address the the wait lists or the wait to care. Um, we found that there was the uh, need for the ability to serve all individuals. Uh, regardless of their payer or the financial resources that they have. Uh, one of our members uh, identified as, you know, essentially a safety net would be payer agnostic. Um, it would be a system that would be culturally sensitive. And then also looking at uh, needing to improve coordination of care. Uh, so for an example of that is uh, trying to get uh, coordinating from one agency to another, let's say primary care into a behavioral health agency to help uh, that there are no uh, breaks in, in treatment, or uh, particularly someone who's being released from uh, uh, being incarcerated, that there's an, an improvement in being able to coordinate care so that they are able to access care, have the medications that they were on, and again, not have a, a break in any treatment that they were um, stable on. Um, and then as we looked at how we would measure um, care, so we uh, would, with simple, simple thought of how would it be a success is, are the recommendations that this committee makes uh, to the larger committee actually adopted? Um, we also uh, had the idea that the safety net committee comes up with recommendations that can be actually implemented within a three-year uh, timeframe. Um, we had put forward that recommendations and the work of the committee covers as much as possible the whole continuum of care, uh, running the spectrum from low-level issues of concerns to crisis interventions and recovery for patients. Um, and then, of course, wanting to make sure that we're creating recommendations that can meet the needs of all the different regions uh, across Colorado as each region has their own specific needs and then uh, also um, strengthening, strengthening the collaboration among the different systems that are sitting at the table with this subcommittee. Um, uh, as we thought about how we would measure okay uh, as we thought about how we would measure 
things. Um, really, the goal was there's there's a lot of measurement tools that are already available that we should access so that we're not reinventing or creating new ways to measure things. Um, we put forward the idea that we, with any recommendation, we should tie uh, a measurement uh, in, uh, process in place, uh, looking at a, a cycle of, of when, when uh, to implement, uh, reassess, make adjustments, and then and follow that, that uh, uh, process again to make sure that, that the um, recommendations that are implemented are actually working. Um, we had, uh, there was a suggestion to measure, uh, since, to make sure that what we're actually doing is af uh, affecting uh, the consumers and, and helping them uh, to get a baseline measurement of their quality of life and then measure that throughout their um, process in the interventions that we put forward to see if that's actually making a change to their life. And also, uh, finally, to have some sense from the uh, larger committee uh, if, uh, to us as to an awareness of when, like a time frame, uh, when recommendations would be accepted, adopted, and implemented moving forward. I think I hit everybody's notes. Great, thanks. Uh, for group three, we had uh, defining a safety net system, an adequately funded system that is flexible to diverse needs of the consumer, which does not reject services based on their diverse needs or background, must be easily identifiable, welcoming, accessible with low barriers to access. And then for our, what success looks like, we had a couple of things. We had an adequate net, uh, a workforce, kind of went back to the definition of achieving the accessibility. Um, but saying that accessibility is not just about availability. Um, for success, we would uh, want to see a, system, uh, a care system that is equitable and consistent statewide um, with a flexible network, uh, a flexible adequate network of providers um, that has a singular care coordination uh, th throughout the system. And if someone wants help, uh, they get that help. The key being a singular care coordination of too many different people coordinating care, um, through whether it be government, private providers, RAIS, there's a lot of different people coordinating care. And then uh, measure for success, uh, few people get, getting into jail for mental health needs, decrease uh, emergency room utilization uh, for sole purpose behavioral health services, reduce suicide rate, and increase um, the enrollment of court, uh, per, court related programs. We did that in record time. So we're going to ask that group two to do the same. For group two, the uh, consumer perspective for the safety net system would be a robust, community-based, flexible, high-quality behavioral health services, uh, regardless of the needs or payer source, that is accessible, transferable, and has consistent and reliable service that meets the unique needs with dependable providers focusing on long-term sustainability in a timely manner. Then the successes would, uh, we want to build on the successes that have already been, that already exist. We want to be impactful to people's lives, fill the gaps with available resources, develop a concrete plan that is executable, and develop a long-term plan and the measure success, some of the ideas is we'd like to see reduction in the M1s and emergency room holds, reduction in minor crime incarcerations, reduction in suicide and suicide attempts, increased community engagement, non-system force to court orders. Uh, we want to set a safety net plan at the end of the subcommittee and development uh, programming such as co-responder teams that can easily meet the needs of the specific community or culture um, within that community. Anybody else? All right. Last but not least. Hi, I'm Marilyn speaking for group one. We ended up with, first of all, we started with what's the low bar? That's just keeping somebody safe and alive. We decided we'd want to go beyond that. And I wrote down a lot of questions. How can we make it so the need for the safety net to fall? is not necessary. Um, how to make it so it's not, services are not punitive. 
How can you make it so it's easy to get out once you're in services? How to, um, how to move to independence when you've been under the safety net? How can you make insurance not an issue? Um, how can you reach out to those everybody in need? The safety net should not have a wrong entry point. And how do we find where the gaps are? What will success look like? Needs are met before the crisis and people feel good about the services. How will we measure success? Pathway to services is easy to navigate, accessible, affordable, pleasant, and offers choices, and that this can happen without a case manager. So one person um, made a really good point, and I just thought it was worth um, uh, mentioning as well, and that's just that um, recovery is a lifelong process, and so acknowledging that and ensuring that the supports are provided uh, throughout to one's lifetime um, so that those crises don't happen. And if you can please leave your notes with us, we really, really will try to capture language. Um, before we move into discussion about we're running out of time, I want to really make sure we preserve time for public comment because there was quite a group today that joined our meeting and make sure that you feel we've had an opportunity to share your thoughts, questions with the subcommittee. And then if we have a couple minutes, we can come back to a little bit of closing discussion around what you heard from one another. So um, questions, comments from any member of the public? So I'll take it. Uh, good afternoon, Jason Chapo from Pueblo, Colorado, Community Mental Health Center there. I just wanted to thank everybody. I wasn't really sure what to expect uh, being a, a kind of a spectator of this process, but just wanted to let you know I'm encouraged uh, thank the subcommittee members for their work, their passion, their insights, and uh, I really do look forward to what this group is going to produce. So thank you for your time. Anyone else that I can't see behind a pillar? Can we pause for Zoom? Yes. So we were just going to open it up to any um, members of the public who have joined us via Zoom who might have questions. Or comments or comments um, and if you're on a phone you have to star six to unmute no? okay all right we have about five minutes left which doesn't leave a ton of time for um, rigorous discussion but is there anything anybody is dying to add about what you heard from another group or anything that you feel like went unsaid and then we can move to closing Just a real uh, quick uh, reflection on the word I heard over there in that group that I hadn't heard in other groups and I think it's really important the word pleasant um, and that is something I think uh, what whatever we call folks um, I go with folks <laughs> thing too but it's okay that they enter uh, the safety net that is a, a comfortable environment and a welcoming environment so appreciate that comment anybody else have anything to Add before we move to some more. Um, just thinking about the quality of the services that we provide folks, um, I think it's important when we talk about cultural competency with providers to not just talk about who gets hired. Um, but how we recruit people into those systems. Um, I've, I've heard it quite a bit that a lot of folks want jobs and systems that are more diverse than the provider groups that we have, um, but they don't get recruited into those positions. And then when they, they do get those positions, they don't feel that they're supported, um, that they have what they need in that workplace to stay there. Um, so I think when we're talking about diversity and cultural competency, it's really important that we up that we need way more diverse provider standards, um, but that we're looking at how we both treat and recruit people who want to be in those systems. Thanks. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, I'm going to all the other uh, subcommittees and the task force. So if there are things that you want the other groups to know, let for all of them to let us know if there are things because there's going to be gaps uh, there's going to be overlap a lot of overlap so uh i'm encouraging you, you 
all to speak up and say, please take this to children's or how are they addressing that? So I just want to remind folks that, um, so we're not sort of working in parallel, but uh, enjoy the discussion today. Did I miss any hands? So before, I'm going to give, um, I'll give Nancy the last word as our, as our co-chair, um, but there are just a few things that we wanted to make sure you knew before you left, that the notes from the meeting will be circulated and made public, um, it's, it's happening within a week of the meetings, and that we have established some standing times for the subcommittee to meet. I, I'm pretty sure all the invites went out for the subcommittee meetings, but they're going to be the first and third Thursday from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. The Farley Center and Summers team are madly working to secure locations that work for us um, from the perspective of the technology we need and the people who are phoning in on Zoom and also a comfortable space to be. So we're working on that madly. And as soon as we know, you will know um, where those meetings are going to be held. And so the next one is August 15th, which is like soon. Yeah, so the first and third starting in September, um, the first Monday, Thursday of August, we will not meet. We'll meet the third, so August 15th, and then start the bi weekly meetings in September. All right. Before you go to Nancy, yeah. real quick before we give Nancy the last word, um, you heard earlier from our communications team, they asked you all to be thinking about the two words. They will be standing at the back of the room as you're exiting, so be prepared to show the two words that you want to capture on video. <laughs> no All right, and real quick, we're just going to let Nancy close the meeting and then you can go out into the heat. I don't have a prepared remark or a slideshow for this, but um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. This was really an energetic and interesting group. Um, I know we have many of the right players um, right here in this room and that we are going to really rock it and uh, come up with some really exciting and innovative um, ideas uh, to propose to the legislature next year. So um, great work and um, keep thinking and keep, there's lots of questions um, and I know that each of us have a little tiny piece of the puzzle so um, be thinking about it, put it kind of somewhere in your mind so uh, even when you're taking your shower or driving to work or something, something comes, write it down. So anyway, it's great to see everybody and thank you very much for your hard work and your dedication and we'll see you August 15th. Yes, and remind them one more time to give us their worksheets. Oh, and uh, those of you who give notes, um, be sure, or yeah, be sure to give us your worksheets. So thank you and have a wonderful, warm summer afternoon. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to